All right. Hi, everyone. So now we're down to more or less the last leg of Zoology 1, which deals with animal diversity. So we will, before we even discuss the many different animals there are in the animal kingdom, let's first look at just a few of the basics that you have to know regarding taxonomy and regarding how animals in general are divided or how they have been categorized or classified. Okay. So first and foremost, there are so many species. You just can't imagine how many species there are of plants, of animals, bacteria. And so when you think about it, I mean, if you don't come up with a system of grouping them together according to whatever things or traits they have in common, you're going to be very confused. So if you look at this um, diagram, as you can see, these would be these would be the phyla that we would be discussing. So quite simply, so you have peripherans, nidarians, flatworms, roundworms, mollusks, segmented worms, the arthropods, the echinoderms, or the sea stars and the holothurians, and also the chordates. So you have mainly 10 groups, well at least for zoology one, but of course there are a lot more, okay? And the fact that there are just so many species, we have to find a way to systematize this or to group them together to make sense of why they are grouped in that way, okay? So let us first look into taxonomy. So who is this dude? La, 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 la. Just kidding. So his name is Carolus Linnaeus. And basically, he came up with the binomial system of nomenclature. So let's break it down. By means two. Nomial from the, um, from the word nomen, which means name. So basically, nomenclature is the act of giving a name to something. So it's a noun form of naming. So this guy, Carolus Linnaeus, what he did was he came up with this system of naming organisms with two names. And so we focus mainly on the genus and the species name. Okay? So we have an example here, which would be the scientific name of your tiger, which is Panthera tigris, and the scientific name of the lion, which is Panthera leo. Okay, so let's first look at the name itself. Well, again, the system is a two-name system. So you have the genus name, which is Panthera, and then the species name, which is Tigris. Okay, so if you notice, if we have human names, we'd be like John Smith, right? And there'd be like maybe a Jane Smith. So... The last name Smith tells you that John and Jane are somehow related. They could be brother, sister, they could be husband, wife, they could be um they could be mother, daughter, I'm sorry, father, daughter, so on and so forth. But the fact that they have the same names, at least we would like to think that they're related at some way. So for the two-name system here, Panthera, would actually be something like the surname. It would tell you that the tiger and the lion are actually very much closely related. And so you can think of it that way, that instead of addressing it as, or, or if we were, if people were named according to how Carolus Linnaeus would name us, um, John Smith would be Smith John. And Jane Smith would be Smith Jane, something like that. So you can think of it that way. So we look into the genus name and the species name. Okay. Now let's look at some basic rules on how to write scientific names. Okay. First and foremost, you can either italicize it 
or you can cap, or I'm sorry, you can underline, okay? And take note that when you underline, it has to be separate. It can't be like one solid line. You can't do that, okay? So it has to be, the lines have to be separate, okay? And note that the first letter of the, your genus name should always be capitalized, okay? And then for your species name or your specific epithet, so specific, another word for it would be the specific epithet, which is the second name. So it's this one. So for your specific epithet or for your species name, everything is in lowercase, okay? So those are the things that you have to note, okay? When you're writing scientific names, it has to be either italicized or they have to be underlined. And also the genus name, the first letter of the genus name has to be capitalized, okay? So again, so many species, right? Now we're just looking at two taxa. So we're just looking at genus and species. We're not even looking at the broader scope, which is quite simply species level. You have your, for example, Panthera leo, which is your lion. The genus would be, it would be Panthera, which means it's part of the big cat group. And maybe the family would be like Felidae, which means it's part of the family of cats. But then the order would be Carnivora, which means it's uh, grouped as a carnivore in general. And maybe the class would be Mammalia, which means it's a mammal. And maybe the phylum would be Chordata, which means it's a chordate, or more or less a vertebrate. Okay? And the kingdom would be Animalia. So that's how we organize it. A while ago, we were just looking at these. But actually, it's part of a larger group. Okay, so I'm going to do a little picture in picture for a bit. Okay, so I hope you can see me. So if, if you notice this, I'm sorry for the bad lighting, but this is actually a Matryoshka doll from, or yeah, it's a Russian, or in, it, basically it's a nesting doll. So as you can see, um, this has like smaller segments, or smaller dolls inside. So it's, it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So, um, but I can't represent everything because of course the dolls can't really get any smaller. So as you can see here, it's, it's getting smaller and until it's just this. So you can think of this as your lion, okay? So this would be like your Panthera Leo, and then maybe it's, it's part of a bigger group. So we put it in that this, this bigger group would be like the cat group, you know? So your lion is part of that group of, of cats in general, right? And cats in general, they're part of an, an even larger group, which should be the group of carnivores. Carnivores meaning meat eaters, there. So they're part of that group. And carnivores would be part of, well, they'd be part of mammals, because they have mammary glands, they produce milk, you know, they have... Um, so on and so forth, and the other characteristics of mammals in general. So, and mammals would be part of, in general, they'd be part of animals. So you can think of it that way. You can think of a matryoshka doll or a nesting doll when you think of taxonomy. That the smaller species that you have is actually part of a much larger group. Okay, so now we're going to take this out. Okay, all right. So that's what it's all about, okay? So now the bases of classification. Let's look into that. Why or how? How did taxonomists um, basically group organisms, right? So there has to be a system, or they had to look into some sets of traits, okay? So first and foremost, well, for one, they would look into whether an organism is unicellular or multicellular. So if you're multicellular, so of course if you're unicellular, usually you'd be part of the group um, of a totally different kingdom, which would be protozoa, which we will also discuss. Okay. Now if you're multicellular, so usually you're called a metazoan. So you're part of that group, metazoa, which means um, basically you're multicellular. Okay. 
Now also, well, for sponges, we will so take note of this term. It's parazoa, which um, means they are somewhat or they are animal-like. You know, but we're we're going to look into that a little more. But just take note of this term. So basically, that's one way of classifying whether you're unicellular or multicellular. So somehow we've split protozoans away, and so we're now left with metazoans. Now, for metazoans, another thing that taxonomists consider would be the body plan or the symmetry. So um, you can look into whether a an organism is symmetrical or asymmetrical. So for example, this sponge is generally asymmetrical. There's just no way that you can divide this organism in, in any plane and you'd come up with two equal halves, right? But let's say for these organisms, for example, the sea star and this um, mammoth, um, there you can definitely see symmetry. So symmetry for um, for the sea star would be called radial symmetry, which means that if you take the center and um, basically you you move through that, uh, you know, you, you take a line through that center, you get two equal halves. At any point that passes through the center, you get two equal halves. So, yep, yep. So that's what you mean by radial symmetry. So at any point it passes through the center, you get two equal halves. Whereas for bilateral symmetry, there's basically just one plane of division that gives you two symmetrical halves there. So that's the difference. Okay. So again, organisms can also be classified according to symmetry. And also, another thing that has been considered would be the developmental pattern of your organism, which is a little more complicated. Okay, so we'll try to discuss this. So first and foremost, in terms of development, we want to look at basically the, the three germ layers. So we call these germ layers. Okay. So the reason why I'm discussing this is so that when we move on to the different um, phyla, um, you wouldn't be confused when I say an organism is this or that. Okay, so now generally you have three germ layers, which would be your ectoderm, which is this blue portion, the outer portion. Okay, the mesoderm, which would be the inner portion, and the endoderm. Okay, so when you are an embryo, so you start off with just a, a zygote, which is just one cell, and then eventually you divide and divide and divide to, and become a multicellular organism. So at some stage in your life, um, or in your development, of course, there are certain cells that are destined to become maybe your skin and your brain. That would be the ectoderm. So that's why these germ layers tell us more or less the destiny of certain groups of cells while you're still developing. So the ectoderm, so all these cells here, will eventually be destined to become the skin and spinal cord, the mesoderm would be more of the muscles, and the endoderm would be more of the gut, basically, your digestive system. So that's just a briefer, okay, on germ layers. And so for germ layers, for developmental patterns, so certain groups are diploblastic or diploblastic, which means that essentially they have just two germ layers. Diplo, which means two. So that means they have just the ectoderm and the endoderm. They don't have the mesoderm. And so an example of that would be the cnidarians. Sorry. So the group of cnidarians, which would be your jellies and yeah, your jellyfish, your anemones, them. So that that would be them. They are diploblastic. Now, if you're not diploblastic, then you probably have all three germ layers, so that means you're triploblastic, or you're triploblastic, okay? So whatever way you want to pronounce it, whatever, okay? So you're triploblastic, so that means you have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. I'm really sorry about the background sound, that's just, oh well, it's a funky neighborhood. But anyway, so there, 
So you're triploblastic if you have all three germ layers, okay? And so humans, basically, we're part of that. We are triploblastic. So we have an ectoderm, a mesoderm, and an endoderm, okay? Now, for triploblastic organisms, they can be further subdivided. I know this is going to get worse, but please bear with me. Yeah. So they can be further subdivided into either into the type of body cavity that they have. So one group would be the acelomate group. And then the next would be the pseudocelomate group. Pseudo coelomate. And then we also have, of course, the u coelomate, or just, uh, yeah, u, or just coelomate would be would be okay. Okay. So what are, what would be the difference between these three? So let's look at the root word, which would be coelom. Okay. The coelom is called the coelom is essentially your body cavity. Okay. So that means it's it's a space in your body, right, that holds all of your organs, right? So for an a coelomate organism, a uh, means without, so it means your organism does not have a body cavity. For example, would be your flatworms. Some of your flatworms do not have body cavities, and so as you can see, that's it. The outer, the skin, the muscles, and the gut. There's just there's the, just nothing, no space there. Okay. Now next would be your pseudo coelomate. Now pseudo means false, as we've learned from pseudo stratified epithelium, right? So as we know, the the if we see the prefix pseudo, it means false. But um, this shouldn't mean that there is no cavity. There's actually a body cavity. Doesn't mean that the body cavity is false or it's fake. No, the body cavity is real. What pseudo refers to is the fact that the lining of your body cavity is not entirely mesodermal. So as you can see, mesoderm would be the tissues in red, right? So this one, right? Now as you can see, the inner lining of the body cavity is endoderm. It's it's um, yellow, right? Here, compare it to this one, which is the u -cel um pattern. As you can see, everything is lined red. So that means the entire lining is of mesodermal uh, nature. So your entire body cavity, this entire space here, is lined with mesoderm. All of that is mesoderm. Mesoderm. Hence, they're called eucelomates. Okay? So the whole point of pseudo and eu, which means true, you know, is, is, is based on the lining, the tissue lining, and not really the presence or absence of the cavity. Okay? There. Okay. So if you think we're done, no, we're not yet. Now, if you are a coelomate, you can be further subdivided. I know it's, like I said, it's going to get worse. But um, hopefully this will be the last. The protostome, you are either a protostome or a deuterostome. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide so that you can see. Okay, so a protostome and a deuterostome. So this half would be your protostome and this would be your deuterostome. Deuterostome. Okay, so again, we see here the body cavities, but that's um, we're not we're only concerned with this part actually. Okay, so proto means first stome from the word stoma, which means mouth. So that means the first mouth. Okay, and deuterostome, which means second. So deutero is second and then stome, stoma, which is mouth. So again, a second mouth or another mouth. So what does that mean? So um, let's look again into the development of, of your embryo. So of it, if the egg or the zygote, the fertilized egg, will eventually divide, 
undergo mitosis, undergo cell division, until you become a ball of cells. And as you can see here, so there's the blastula, and then the gastrula, and all that. And so, um, this part here is called the blastopore. Okay? So the blastopore, it will eventually go through and through something like this, and that will be where, you know, that will be the formation of your gut. So remember, I mean, if you open your mouth, right? I mean, if you eat food, it goes out your butt eventually, right? So that means, you know, you're creating a tube. In, inside this ball of cells, which makes sense, because if you don't create the tube, you will not have a mouth, and you will not have an asshole, okay? So it's quite simple, okay? Now for protostome, what that simply means is that this blastopore becomes, or the mouth, the mouth is basically the blastopore, or the, yeah, the, the fate of the blastopore becomes the mouth. And then the anus develops eventually, you know, it, it sort of ends, you know, it, the, the invagination gets deeper and deeper until you form the anus at the other end, okay? So that's what the protostome means, mouth first, okay? But for a deuterostome, if you are a deuterostome, the blastopore, the fate of your blastopore is that this first becomes the anus, so this is actually the butthole first, and then you form another, you form the mouth here. So that's why it's called deuterosome, or a second mouth, because your mouth is actually formed somewhere else, okay? But the blastopore, you know, that pore will eventually become the asshole, right? So you take a guess. If you have to take a guess, humans in general, or chordates, what are we? Are we deuterostomes or are we protostomes? So actually we are deuterostomes. So you can just imagine what that would mean. Okay, and I will tell you at the end of this. Okay. So those are just some of the bases of classification um, that we will be encountering when we discuss the different phyla. Okay, so now let's look at just um, more or less a simplified diagram of how this is going to look like. So again, unicellular versus multicellular, right? So protozoans, they're split, okay? Because most, because they're all unicellular, so they're a different kingdom altogether, okay? Now next would be multicellular. So the rest of us, the metazoans, we will be part of kingdom Animalia, okay? Now, here is um, what I wanted to discuss earlier, the parazoans. So for multicellular organisms, you're divided into, you're either a parazoan. If you're a parazoan, that means you don't really form tissues, you know. So you're just an aggregation of cells. You could say that you're a colony of cells, but you're not really forming tissues, you know. Okay, so we're going to discuss that as we look into sponges, okay. And then... For you metazoans, or the real metazoans, or the real tissue formers, so you can be diploblastic or triploblastic. So that means, again, you have two germ layers. For diploblastic, you have two germ layers, just the ectoderm and the endoderm. And for triploblastic, you form all three. You have all three germ layers, okay? Now for triploblastic, again, we have three different subcategories. Acelomate, the ones without any body cavities. Pseudo and pseudocelomate and eucelomates, they do have body cavities, but the lining of the body cavity for the pseudocelomate is not entirely mesoderm. For the coelomate, everything is of mesodermal um, nature. The lining of the body cavity is entirely mesoderm. Okay. And of course, if you are coelomate, you are either a protostome or a deuterostome. Okay, protostome means the, the, your mouth develops from the blastopore. So the first pore that, for, that forms, or the first opening that forms as you are just a ball of cells would be your mouth. Whereas for the deuterostome, the first opening that forms would be your butt. Okay, your, your butthole. Okay, 
So that is how to summarize. To, yeah, that's how to summarize basically everything. Okay, so this would be just um, basically just some of the ways, or some of the categories, or some of yeah, some of the criteria that taxonomists use in order to group these organisms. Okay, so um, as we mentioned, each phyla. Um, I'm just going to mention eventually that they are, for example, for cnidarians, I'm going to mention that they are diploblastic. And so I hope that this video will give you an idea of what that means. That's the whole objective. Okay? So um, I would like to end this uh, lecture with, with just a short quote. So we should never think too highly of ourselves, for we were all once nothing but assholes. Yes. At that very you know, beginning of your life almost, you were just an asshole. So yeah, so there's nothing to be proud of, so we should all just laugh at our mistakes, you know, and have fun, because I mean, we started out as assholes, right? So yeah. Okay, so again, I would just like to have a short disclaimer. I don't own any of the pictures here. Um, I got some of them from Hickman, and uh, I got the diagram from Pachinik, okay? And I would like to give credit to their respective owners. And again, it's just me. It's Miss B. So let's chill.